welcome to the 12th London Asian Food Festival. It is indeed such an honor to have you here amongst us. First of all, a very spontaneous question. How do you feel being among the ardent fans in a foreign land? Um, flattered, of course. Obviously, you know, I mean, uh, who doesn't like to be admired? Actually, that was a global platform, why not? Yes, and um, well, London is really not quite foreign that way, is it? You know, I mean, it's a fairly familiar place. It's a kind of extension of Mumbai in many ways for us, yes. Absolutely. So starting off first, you did an MA in economics and thereafter you took to advertising. How did you manage that move from economics to advertising and what was the real motivation behind it? See, my motivation from the time I was little was to become a filmmaker, not to be either in advertising nor to be an economist. The reason for doing all those things was largely because I happened to be in a place, I grew up in a place where there was no film industry of any kind, and if I even suggested to anyone that I wanted to be a filmmaker, they would have thought that I had a hole in my head or I needed to be sent to the loony bin, you know, because uh, no such opportunity existed anywhere close by. Meaning, you know, this, this was in Hyderabad, there was no film industry there. there was only, the film industry in India was located in Bombay, in Calcutta and in Madras in those days. And uh, going from there, you know, I come from a fairly modest family, so there was no question of my being able to go there and hang about the film studios to get a job, you know. So the next best thing my parents thought was that I should at least get myself educated so I won't go hungry, you know. And uh, I ended up getting myself a master's in economics because that's a subject that I enjoyed doing in the university. But um, my way into film started through advertising simply because the, it was the, uh, when I got into advertising, there was seminally the first commercials were being made in India, you know, advertising film commercials. And it was an tremendous copywriter. I mean, this was a tremendous opportunity for me to start writing film scripts and to make films. Where would you get an opportunity like that straight off, you know, without any training, without having assisted anybody or trained anybody um, under anybody or being an intern or going through a film school. Also, there were no film schools then. And the only way people got into the film industry were, if they wanted to be directors, had to be kind of nth assistant to some director and made your way slowly up the ladder until you actually became the first assistant. And then you're never sure whether you're going to be the director at all or not. In the meanwhile, you would have got caught up in the way that man is making his films. And you'd be so influenced by that, which is something that I didn't want to do. I wanted to be in films to make my kind of film and nobody else's kind of film. I didn't want to be influenced by anyone. So this was the best way for me. So I ended up the next 10 or 11 years, I ended up by making, what, about over a thousand commercials. And so, after that you decided to move into filmmaking, so how did that move really happen when you started oh, making yeah, Angkor? It was very difficult. The reason why I remained so long in advertising was largely because opportunities were so few and the script that I had written, I would worked on a script, you know, for many years and it, it turned out to be eventually the script of my first film, Ankur. Um, but I could never get anybody interested in funding me. The entire film industry, I must have, well, I trudged to all these people's offices and studios over 12 years until I got my first opportunity to make a feature. And when I did, of course, luckily, luckily for me, the film turned out to be a huge success. It was a big hit as well. It was successful critically, it was successful in the marketplace. So it meant that I had come to stay. 
Right. Very often, um, after making Ankur and Manthan, your films have taken a shape of a uh, biographical narrative. Uh, you made Zubeda and you made one film. Not necessarily. You know, I've made so many different kinds of films. One of them has been the uh, biographical genre. But uh, I've made different kinds of films. I've done films in history. I've done taken literary works to make films. Uh, all, all sorts of, yeah, there's so many different kinds of subjects. And I don't like to repeat myself, either in terms of genres or even in terms of the form of film. So, except that I love telling stories, which means that uh, they, most of my films will have a fairly strong narrative. But the narrative need not necessarily be told from A to Z, you know, not that sort of thing. It can vary, it can be differently told, because the whole idea is that film has to be an experience. If it is not an experience, and if it eventually does not offer us any kind of insight, it's not worth having been made. So that was one of, that's one of the reasons why I've always been a bit restless in the manner in which I choose to make subjects and films, you know. Right. Can, can you pick up one film that has really sort of been one profound memory in your uh, career? That All of them. All films that I have made have, you see, have been great experiences. Because for me, filmmaking is fun. It's a great passion for me. It's also fun making movies. It's not work. If I don't enjoy making a film, I will not make it. Then I have to enjoy making a film. That's when I make a film. And if that's what happens, then each film is an adventure of its own kind, you know? So you can't, they're non-comparable. They're not comparable one to the other. Yeah. Absolutely. You would have noticed that over time, since the time you started making, you know, you started with Ankur and Manth and you made Subeda, audiences have changed? The taste of audiences have changed? Oh, audiences change with every generation. You know, there's a whole generation change that takes place. And with each generation, you, uh, um, I, who am now uh, sort of, you know, ancient in that sense, because I started making films a long time ago. Um, younger people, as, as each generation comes, they have their own predilection, their own way of looking at the world, and uh, they redefine for themselves what uh, film entertainment should be, and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you have to keep um, a pace with them. It's a question of uh, trying to um, find out how to make contact with them. See, what you have to say, usually with most people, it's usually something that they always wanted to say, you know, something that affects them very deeply or is something that they're concerned with. Those concerns don't necessarily change, but it's the manner in which you project them. And that depends on the way they become acceptable to that particular generation, you know. So you have to relearn to do that constantly. And that's very important. And of course, the, particularly in India, the, you know, India is going to be and is already the youngest country in the world. We have the largest number of young people in the whole world and it will remain that way for another 50 years. So which means that India is going to be the youngest country in the world for the next 50 years. And, and therefore, you have to concern yourself with young people in every which way. You see, unlike Europe or the United States, uh, it's very difficult for us now to make films. Like in, in Europe, you'll see the number of films that are being made on older people, you know, and their problems or their interests and their stories, stories about older people. Now, if we make um, films about older people in India, that's a real death knell for that film because audiences will not connect because our, your audiences are very young. You know, 90% of our audiences are less than 35 years of age. You know, and they, so you have to look at what they, what they get uh, interested in or get worked up with, you know. Right.